Hey, it's me. Knowing better. Don't adjust your whatever device you're watching this on. It's me. Live and in stereo. No gimmicky titles, no 13 title cards, and this time, no guess. Get a snack, settle in, because I'm about to tell you why this show is the worst thing to happen to mental health awareness in recent memory. 13 Reasons Why? Welcome to your tape. This video is brought to you by Dashlane. 13 Reasons Why is a teen drama on Netflix that has sparked a lot of controversy since the first season came out last year. It covers sex, suicide, mental health, substance abuse, you name it. Their stated goal in the trigger warning that precedes the first episode is to start a conversation. If you've been following me on Twitter, you know that I have a deep-seated hatred for this show and the way that it glorifies mental health issues, and specifically suicide. The show also gets a lot wrong about high school, which is weird considering what a universal experience that is. You'd think the producers would know what high school is like. We could spend hours discussing plot holes, like how adults don't seem to exist in this universe at all, or how the cliques are incredibly well defined. There are no jocks and band, and there are no band geeks in yearbook. Think about your high school experience. Was anybody just one thing? We could also talk about silly nitpicks, like how Jessica's dad is in the Air Force, but nobody else's parents are. Do they live 200 miles away from the nearest base or something? How is he the only one? Or how about the fact that Tony thinks that cassette tapes are a superior medium? You're still in the old media, huh? Ah, uh, it's so much better. In what universe is that true? You can make the case that vinyl sounds better. We could have that debate, but audio cassettes? Come on. No, we're not here to nitpick those things. I'm not a film critic. But if you are interested in that sort of thing, as well as some of the more technical aspects, I recommend this video by I Hate Everything. I really need to figure out what's causing that. We're here to talk about the broken psychology and inaccurate depictions of mental health in the show. We are going to start a conversation. For those of you unfamiliar with the show, the basic premise is that Hannah Baker kills herself and leaves behind several audio tapes with 13 reasons explaining why she did it. The set gets passed from person to person until they reach Clay, the main protagonist and audience surrogate. We listen to the tapes and learn things along with him and experience the flashbacks just as he does. It was actually a pretty clever narrative device to have him crash his bike in the first episode. If he has a scar, it's currently happening. If he doesn't, it's a flashback. In the beginning of season two, Hannah reappears to Clay, not in a flashback, but in current time. So you talk now? Apparently. There are only two possible explanations for this. A, Hannah is a ghost, in which case I have some rather strong opinions, which I've discussed before. You don't get to come back and watch your epic revenge fantasy unfold. But since executive producer Selena Gomez described the series as so real, we can assume that's not the case, which leaves us with option B, Clay has schizophrenia. It's somewhat alluded to during season one that Clay had a mental health issue that required medication and therapy in the past. But we're never given any context, so maybe they're leaving that for season three. Yes, there's going to be a season three. Schizophrenia doesn't usually present itself until your early to mid 20s, so it's a little odd that he's already showing symptoms. There are two main symptoms of schizophrenia. Delusions are a false belief about reality. Everything from that person is a secret robot replacement, to the government is being run by reptilian shapeshifters, to all of this is just a computer simulation. This is just a symptom of schizophrenia. If you happen to believe any of these, that doesn't mean you have schizophrenia, but you might. Clay doesn't appear to have any delusions, but he is experiencing hallucinations, seeing or hearing something that isn't actually there. Hallucinations come in many different forms and affect literally every sense. A good example of a tactile hallucination is when you feel your phone vibrate in your pocket, but when you go to I'm actually convinced that it does vibrate because sometimes when I look, I'll see the notification to... Anyway, most hallucinations that we're concerned with are either auditory, so you're hearing voices, or visual, you're seeing things. Clay is experiencing both, an audio-visual hallucination of a girl who isn't really there, which is rare, but not impossible. The problem with this depiction is how he responds to and interacts with the hallucination. Firstly, hallucinations are usually quick or fleeting. They appear for a moment and then hide behind a tree or a corner when you try to get a better look. And then when you go to investigate, they're gone. Secondly, they're usually scary. Nobody's hallucinating that they're on a date with a supermodel or magic mic. It's usually somebody is trying to kill you or is watching you. 
This is what causes idiots who are high on salvia to run into traffic or jump out of the window of their second story apartment. Because thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, you don't know that you're hallucinating. You might realize it afterwards and have a laugh while you upload the video to YouTube. You might even know that you're going to hallucinate, which is why you set up the camera in the first place. But in the moment, it is real. Your brain is telling you that what you're seeing and hearing is actually happening. So Clay realizing that she isn't real and still having full conversations with her is an inaccurate depiction of a hallucination. Earlier in the first episode, she appears in the background or he mistakes people for her, but she always disappears in a flash because hallucinations are fleeting. It even gets in the way of his relationship with Skye. What the f At first I wanted to applaud the show for its depiction of teenage sex. Oh, it sounds creepy when I say that. The typical Hollywood trope is that all it takes for a teenage boy is a strong breeze. Open my window and a breeze rolls in and I But in reality, the opposite is just as common and they go out of their way to show that. I, I like the way you look. I like you. Really? Because your body is kind of saying the opposite. This is psychogenic erectile dysfunction, meaning it's psychological in origin rather than biological. These kids are way too young to be having biological problems in that regard. They're just way too nervous, or their mind is elsewhere, or they're hallucinating. It really does happen to a lot of guys, your girlfriend's not lying to you. But then they throw it all out the window and have the creepy incel ruin his pants in a movie theater. What's wrong? Sorry. Sky is Clay's girlfriend in season two, at least when he's not obsessing over Hannah, and she's your typical goth GF. Sky has bipolar disorder. A person without this disorder goes through normal ups and downs, but it's much more pronounced in someone who is bipolar. They go from a deep depression to mania. Most people understand what depression is, we've all experienced it at some point, but mania is a little more difficult to wrap your head around. People going through a manic state feel invincible. Not physically, obviously, but they feel great and like nothing could ever ruin this. So they engage in risky behavior like gambling and drug use and sex. Now, I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so I was able to diagnose her with bipolar disorder during this scene. We hang out, mostly. What does that mean? I, I never know. Is that, is that slang for sex? Mom! I just hope you're being careful. <laughs> oh come on, no adult in that room would not know what just happened there. It's later confirmed that she has that disorder while she's staying at an inpatient mental health resort. Look, are they sure it's bipolar? I mean, it feels like kind of a blurry line between someone being manic and also just, you know, being in a really good mood. But I would also argue that she has borderline personality disorder, which is often comorbid with bipolar, meaning they occur at the same time. Having borderline personality disorder means that those ups and downs are much more unstable and sudden. Sky goes from a manic episode to an incredibly depressed episode in a matter of minutes, and then goes home to self-harm. Along with Minecraft, Sky also does non-suicidal self-injury, or NSSI, more commonly known as cutting. Then what's that? It's what you do instead of killing yourself. There are three main reasons why people self-harm, and in order to discuss them, we need to talk about conditioning. I hope you paid attention during your intro psych class. If you want to get someone to do something, there are two ways to go about it, with a reward or punishment. Though in psychology, we call it reinforcement or punishment. And then there are two types of each of these positive and negative. Positive and negative don't mean good or bad in this context. It means that you're getting something or taking something away. So a positive reinforcement is something that we all understand. You're getting something good as a reward. Positive punishment is also something we all understand, though the name sounds a bit contradictory. You are getting a punishment. A negative reinforcement is when something bad is taken away. Maybe a siren turns off when you stand in a certain place or a headache goes away after you take medication. The behavior is reinforced forced by stopping a bad thing from happening. A negative punishment, on the other hand, is when you take away something good, like being grounded or banned from a video game. So now that we have that covered, why do people self-harm? Positive reinforcement is unfortunately a big contributor. Someone who's feeling neglected will self-harm and is suddenly showered with care and attention. It's an attention-seeking behavior in the same vein as Munchausen syndrome. The person obviously needs medical attention and mental health care, but that's also the reason they did it in the first place, so it's kind of a catch-22. Positive punishment is somewhat more rare. Someone will physically punish themselves for some moral failing or wrongdoing. This is common in people who suffered abuse as a child and no longer have a parental figure to dole out punishment, so 
they do it to themselves. Sky, as far as I can tell, doesn't fall into this category, but negative reinforcement does seem to fit the bill. She's taking away the emotional pain she's feeling by replacing it with physical pain. As soon as she feels a depressive state coming on, she goes home and cuts herself to stop it. She doesn't want to die. People who cut don't do it with suicidal intent. It's just the pain they're after, thus the name. Unfortunately, well over half of people who self-harm eventually attempt suicide. So if they tell you it's nothing to worry about, it's not nothing. Hannah commits suicide before the first episode. She didn't self-harm or show symptoms of any mental health issues before that. But two of the 13 causes she lists involve sexual assault. One of them happens to her, and the other to a friend while she's hiding in a closet. Now, I've heard criticisms of Hannah's response to these assaults, and in the case of her friend, felt it myself. Why didn't she do anything? Whether it was trying to stop it, or screaming, or calling the cops, she could have done something, right? To respond to that criticism, we need to talk about your fight or flight response. Your nervous system has multiple parts and subdivisions. It's not just your brain. Your brain is the central nervous system, or CNS, but you also have a peripheral nervous system which branches off from your spinal cord and is never abbreviated, and it can make decisions and perform actions independently from your brain. It's not like a separate person or anything, it's very basic decisions. Have you ever touched a hot stove and pulled your hand back before you even felt that it was hot? That's your peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system also has two parts, the somatic, which controls movement and sensory input, and the autonomic, which regulates your physiological functions. The autonomic nervous system is what regulates your arousal level through, yet again, two systems. The sympathetic nervous system ramps you up for your fight or flight response, while the parasympathetic calms you down for rest and digest. So what happens when you encounter something stressful, like a lion or your friend being assaulted? The amygdala is activated, followed by the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal glands releasing epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, which along with raising your heart rate and affecting your senses, also slows down your perception of time so you can react more quickly and decide whether to run away or stand your ground. But that doesn't happen with Hannah, does it? Because fight or flight is an incomplete understanding of the available options. It's actually fight, flight, or freeze, which is the most common response in modern humans. It's the deer in headlights. You don't know what to do, so instead, you do nothing. Do Hannah doesn't know if running away will cause more harm or fighting back will cause more harm. So she freezes, whether she's the victim or a witness. So at least her response is consistent in both situations. Now let's talk about the suicide. Is it possible we can be done with all this? I mean, it's been over a week. Isn't it healthy to like move on? The school is right to be concerned. Knowing someone who commits suicide increases the likelihood of friends and family to commit suicide by 65% or more. It's called suicide contagion and it can happen in a local cluster or even nationally when it's someone like a celebrity. So the school is reacting appropriately to try and get out ahead of any copycat suicides, which is exactly what ends up happening anyway. Alex attempts to kill himself by shooting himself in the head, which doesn't work, when in reality it works 97 to 99% of the time. This is in contrast to Hannah who kills herself by cutting her, whoa whoa I am not showing that scene are you crazy? I also disagree with the show showing that, it was pure shock value and nothing more. Anyway in reality cutting your wrists only works 1.2 to 6% of the time, so it's flipped for some reason. Not to mention the show and various other media depictions make it look like it only takes a few seconds or minutes, when in reality it takes four to six hours if it works at all. Your body is incredibly resilient to injuries like that. Remember that scene from Saving Private Ryan? Whereas gunshots to the head in the show and elsewhere sometimes don't work. Oh yeah. I have my own tinfoil hat theories as to why the show flips the success rate, but I'll let you discuss that down below. You have a cane and a scar. Where? Where is the scar? I get that they wouldn't want him to have some disfiguring scar that they would have to apply every day before filming, but they had no problem with doing that for Clay in the first season. Later they try to say that his scars are under his hair, which he grew out, which is supposed to be the narrative device this season to differentiate between flashbacks. So let's try to figure this out together. He isn't Phineas Gage, he didn't shoot up and through, that would be horribly disfiguring and we would see that. In fact, there doesn't seem to be any frontal lobe damage at all. He also didn't hit his occipital lobe in the back of the brain since 
since his vision seems to be intact. The temporal lobes are the next candidate, but this would also damage his hearing and speech, which doesn't seem to be the case. Which leaves us with the parietal lobe, which controls sensory and motor function, and given his limp and later erectile issues makes the most sense. But he also has another plot convenient symptom. The bullet went up and then in and out of my skull and into the wall. That's what they told me. You don't remember? No, I don't remember anything of like a month before that. Okay, forgetting that up and in and out doesn't entirely make sense, that's not how amnesia works. That's not how any of this works. There are several different types of memory and therefore several different types of amnesia. There's implicit memory, which is unconscious and pertains to things like language and skills. And then there's explicit memory, which is conscious and contains two parts. Because everything so far contains two parts. Firstly, there's semantic memory, which is facts, definitions, and dates and stuff. And secondly, episodic memory, which is events and experiences. They don't always have to be autobiographical. If you watch a movie or hear a story from a friend, that's logged as an episodic memory, whether it happened to you or not. It would seem based on his recollection that he's lost his autobiographical episodic memory. If you lose your memory for the past, that's retrograde amnesia, everything from before the damage or disease. You can also lose your ability to form new memories, or enterograde amnesia, which is what happened to Drew Barrymore in a movie that shall not be named, usually caused by damage or disease to the subcortical structures most notably the hippocampus. It's usually all or nothing when it comes to memory loss from physical damage to the brain. You can psychologically repress a memory for a traumatic event, so I can kind of understand not remembering the shooting itself, but not remembering only a plot-specific month from before the attempt is basically impossible. With amnesia, he'd probably forget a ton of other things too, like people's names, his school schedule, or his Facebook password. I need to remember unless he had Dashlane. Dashlane not only stores and secures your passwords, but it generates a unique password for every website and account you use, including social media, stores, and banks. You don't need to remember anything. Dashlane autofills the login and password fields for you. And just in case you suffer global amnesia, it remembers and autofills your birthday, phone number, and address too. If you thought I was gonna show that information, you should know better. You can get started for free by heading over to dashlane.com slash knowingbetter and save yourself hours of time changing and remembering your passwords. Likewise, you can save 10% on a premium membership, which saves an unlimited number of passwords on more devices than you currently own, by using the code KNOWINGBETTER within 35 days of signing up. You'll also be supporting the channel when you do. The show gets a few things correct, but it gets a lot of things wrong. In order to depict some of these disorders, they have to crank it up to 11. Showing a more accurate, mild bipolar disorder wouldn't really come through the screen that well. But in these exaggerations, they lose a lot of the nuance of human behavior, which can lead people to dismiss actual mental health issues as not that bad. If 13 Reasons Why is the standard you're holding people up to when thinking about disorders, then very few people have disorders that need addressing. Not everyone with schizophrenia will hallucinate dead people. The creators wanted to start a conversation, and now we can have that conversation because now you know better. Wow, look at all these new patrons, I can barely fit them anymore. Including my newest legendary patron, another Eric. If you'd also like to climb into this clown car that is the end card, head on over to patreon.com slash knowingbetter. What did you think of the show? Let me know down below and don't forget to... Uh... I, uh... Hmm. It'll come to me, just, just give me a, a second.